This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Here we are on a given Wednesday, Community Matters, with our old friend Brett Obergaard, <laughs> assistant professor in, the, in uh, journalism in the UH um, NOAA, what is it, the School of Communications. School thank of Communications. Thank you so much for being here, yeah. Oh, thank you for having me. Yeah, so important. We have to keep track of this because it's a moving target, you know. <laughs> That's for sure. And uh, we started out with, uh, you know, uh, with uh, Trump's uh, attacks on the press. It started immediately with the fake news, a, except, you know, it's, it's something out of 1984. Some, some news is more fake than other news. <laughs> <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> and, and, and some, you know, sources of news are, are more the enemy of the people than other sources of so George Orwell, Animal Farm, was it Animal? Some pigs are... <laughs> yeah, some pigs are more uh, equal than others or something like that. <laughs> Created more equal than others. <laughs> so I mean, the whole thing is a mind, a mind uh, is the word for that. Yeah. Anyway, so now here we are, and there have been things, you've been sending me articles really worth looking at to see how all of this is going because it's dynamic. You know, the whole attack on fake news and enemy of the people and, and um, you know, the war against the press... This is not static. Mm -hmm. This changes. It changes from what he says. It changes from the environment around what he says, and 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 the context of you know people wondering what whether what he says is accurate or not. It, it, and it changes because the because the press changes and journalism people in journalism change. And so it, it strikes me from the articles you sent, we should discuss them one by one. Um, you know, that we, we have a dynamic going on right now, and it isn't what it was, say, you know, 18 months ago. It's different. Mm. The war mm. against the press is mm -hmm. different. Mm. The, the, the profession of journalism, isn't that amazing, is different. <laughs> yeah, it's rapidly yeah. changing. I was uh, reminiscing earlier today about how big a news it was when Dan Quayle spelled potato wrong <laughs> and how people went crazy, and I was thinking... <laughs> Now it's like potato being spelled wrong a hundred times a day, <laughs> and we never get to the we never get to the original potato. Right, right. So I mean, starting well, let's talk about the articles. Okay, you okay. sent me two articles, but uh -huh. it flowers out to more than that. Uh -huh. uh, one of them was about was about uh, increased registrations in journalism programs. That is fascinating. Can you tell me about it? Yeah, we've noticed it on the ground at University of Hawaii in our journalism program. We have the only journalism major in the Pacific region, and so. People who really want to study journalism, they come to us. And we've noticed in the last, basically since uh, Trump was elected, that there has been a kind of energy, a new energy. And it's not a, a left or right energy. It's just a new energy about journalism. And that energy is exciting people and engaging people and making people think about news and truth in new ways. And, and that has led to... Uh, you know, a lot of people signing up for our classes, a lot of people taking them, and a lot of people becoming journalism majors. And there was a recent article in the Washington Post that basically went across the nation and found that to be true of programs across the country. Oh, so University of Hawaii is consistent with lots of other schools then. Mm -hmm. It's a national change here, a sea change. Yeah, know? it's not an isolated local phenomenon. It's, a, it's a, a national change, I think, similar to what happened after Watergate. Yeah. After Watergate, you had this big rush of people wanting, you know, to basically um, do the kind of investigative work that happened there and to, to bring, you know, that kind of truth back to our country. And I think the same, not, not exactly the same, but a very similar uh, uh, energy is happening now. Yeah, well, maybe it's really interesting, common denominator between Watergate and now is Bob Woodward. Yeah, his new book, right. <laughs> He's larger than life, and now two huge scandalous administrations. <laughs> yeah, I read a story the other day that said this is like the bookends of his career. You know, the first one started it. He was not a prominent journalist at the time. He was just kind of an everyday beat writer. And uh, this one now, uh, you know, you don't want to say it's the last big thing he'll do, but it's, you know, toward the end of his career, and he's did a monumental job on this uh, story. Yeah, he's a perfect guy to have done it too because of mm -hmm. what happened in Deep Throat and all that. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and you know, when you face his credibility off against Trump's credibility, there is no comparison. When he tells you he did this according to journalistic standards, you believe it completely. I do. Yeah. And, uh, he follows uh, the ethical code. He records all his interviews. There's no um, shortcuts he takes, yeah. as far as I know. And um, you know, his work speaks for itself. Yeah. There's not really any question if it's true. You might not like the, what you read in it, but it's um, you know as close to truth as, as a person can get. Yeah. I bought the book. Yeah. And I downloaded it from this is a interesting piece. I downloaded it from Amazon in approximately two seconds <laughs> for 14 or 15 bucks. Right. And um, that, that's it's high news for me because it's it's drilled down in depth um, and it's from a respected journalist on a, a very acutely relevant issue right now. And uh, furthermore, you know, it, it came, what, a couple of days before that uh, remarkable op-ed piece in the New York Times. Mm -hmm. Almost, simultaneous. Yeah, yeah, almost I think, simultaneous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The excerpts actually came out before the editorial, and they were kind of working together for a while. Yeah. Was that, that op-ed piece uh, troubled you that it was anonymous? Yes. And, you know, I've talked about that here before, that uh, I'm not a fan of anonymous sourcing. I don't believe there was anything in that op-ed that um, we didn't already know. We didn't know it in the way we knew it, but I, I don't think, I wouldn't have traded the anonymity for that. I would have made the person go on the record. Or not, or not publish it. Or not publish it. Yeah. I didn't think there was anything in there that was so groundbreaking that, um, I mean, yes, the, the hiding the papers from him. I mean, there's some definitely some interesting aspects to it that were sort of you know, new or, or uh, sensational. But the fact of the, the matter was that you have an incompetent person in that job and, and that editorial basically just reinforced that in a way that we all, you know, basically understand already. So to offer anonymity to that person, I think, was really unfair to the American people who want to know. Uh, you know, essentially this person is admitting that they're undermining the elected president of the United States which to me is a very troubling thing. It doesn't matter who's in the office there, that you have a, a staff doing secret deeds, good, good or bad, you know, like I don't want him to, you know, uh, cause a nuclear war or anything like that, but good or bad, it, it, it doesn't seem right what happened there when people are um, secretly, you know, uh, uh, affecting the outcome of our, our country in, in ways that they aren't accountable to voters. There are such interesting issues raised by that. Mm -hmm. I mean, now the guy claims, or, or woman, we don't know, <laughs> um, that he's protecting the public by removing letters and all that from Trump's desk, um, by standing between, you know, the presidency and, uh, and Trump's impulsive behavior and decision process. Um, so he's protecting us, he says, by doing that on, on matters of conscience, not on everything. Some <laughs> yeah, things right, he yeah. agrees so, some with. things, right. So he doesn't take any action on those letters and those steps. Yeah. Um, but where he disagrees, he's protecting us, and he's doing it anonymously. If now, if he came at it the other way, if, he, if the New York Times said, <clears throat> uh, "Sorry, we're not going to publish this unless you identify yourself," and he did identify himself, if he did identify himself, um, then um, he'd be fired immediately. Trump, Trump would have fired him instantly. And we would not have had, uh, this is questionable, the benefit quote, that's in, ca in, in quotes, the benefit of this guy protecting us by being um, you know, a sort of a secret mole <laughs> in the Oval Office, taking steps to protect us from some impulsive conduct, but not other impulsive conduct. Um, yeah, that's why are, I, is the democracy better off if he stays in there and continues to do what he says he was doing? I don't think so. I think... He, if he felt this way and was doing was doing this kind of action, should sign he or she. It could be Nikki Haley. It could be anybody. Uh, sign sign the editorial. Uh, fall on your sword. Quit the job. Probably would be a national hero, and um, and then we'd be able to deal with the pro real problems as opposed to this kind of uh, backroom, you know, mm -hmm. sneakiness that. Uh, number one, I don't really believe he, that he's he or she is doing the good of the American people anyway. I think this the editorial to me seemed like 
uh, an excuse making uh, system for why these people are still in those jobs. And it gives everybody cover to be in those jobs. Like, oh, they're protecting us. They're doing these sneaky things. So let's not, you know, question what they're doing because what they say to the camera, they don't really believe that. You know, this is, again, part of this whole fake news idea that, um, you know, we don't really believe what the person says. We don't believe the documents. We don't believe what we hear. We don't believe what we see because there's this whole subtext going on where people are really doing the noble thing behind the scenes. It just, it, to me, it's just... Uh, uh, a horrific um, travesty of, of what our country was supposed to be. Yeah. Well, I mean, hard, uh, desperate times for desperate moves or whatever they say. And um, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who would agree with you and some who would disagree with you. Mm -hmm. uh, they want to know what this guy was saying. They would buy into his point about it's more important that you know what's happening than you know the source. But the source, from a journalistic point of view, is very important. You That's measure the, the credibility by the source. The source is everything. Yeah. You measure the credibility, you measure the motives. You, you, I mean, every part of what you understand about a piece of information comes from the source. Yeah. Uh, you know, how credible, how not credible, how valid, how not valid. Um, so with the, with the anonymous, uh, you know, cloak on this editorial, I found it very troubling, and I definitely wouldn't, wouldn't have published it if I was the... Yeah. Publisher of the New York Times, but yeah. And if you shake it and bake it, a lot of it is this guy trying to keep his job. Well, it's narcissistic. Like, only I can save you. You know, I'm the one in here. If yeah. I if I quit and they put somebody else in there, this person would be so much worse. Yeah. You know, so it sort of plays along the the Trump pattern of, um, you know, savior. Yeah. And at the end of the day, this is an erosion of of the system in general to have somebody like that. Uh, it's a terrible erosion, yeah. and this is a slope that none of us should go down. Yeah. I don't care if your person is in office or not in office, but to see that happening, and you imagine, okay, if the tides were turned, would you want that to be happening? No, <laughs> you'd want, because you, one person is getting the uh, votes, and the one person's being evaluated publicly, and all the other people basically are free to do what they want in this case and, and uh, without any accountability, which is circus. It's, it's, it's a circus. <laughs> we'll be right back. We're going to do a short break. When we come back, we're going to talk about the second article, <laughs> okay, that Brett sent me. We'll be right back. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. If you're not in control of how you see yourself, then who is? Live above the influence. They said I could play, so any chance to play at all. You know, that's my life. I love music. Yeah, that's how we do it. Hello, my name is Stephanie Mock, and I'm one of three hosts of Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Food and Farmer series. Our other hosts are Matt Johnson and Pamai Weigert. And we talk to those who are in the fields and behind the scenes of our local food system. We talk to farmers, chefs, restaurateurs, and more to learn more about what goes into sustainable agriculture here in Hawaii. We are on at Thursdays at 4 p.m. and we hope we'll see you next time. Okay, we're back with Brett Opergard, Assistant Professor of Journalism at UH Manoa. We so enjoy having him on the show. It's really <laughs> core stuff for us. So, you know, uh, during the break, we talked about the distinction between this op-ed piece in the New York Times and Deep Throat way back when. It's different, right? Big difference because Deep Throat was an anonymous source, but a not an anonymous source that appeared in the newspaper at all. No information provided ever ended up being printed. So mm -hmm. Deep Throat was a source that basically pointed Woodward and Bernstein to stories, did not um, you know, actually appear in the stories. And then and today we're having this, this, like this conversation about an editorial Number one, so the person's free reign to say whatever opinion they wanted. It's way different. And then they could say it without, with anonymity and not have any accountability for what they said. Right. So um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a significantly different um, piece of journalism and I think a much worse piece. It's reminiscent to the whole thing mm -hmm. about social media because you don't know where the social media is coming from. 
as, as hard as Facebook is now trying to search for fake news and the like, in social media, you can fake out who you are. You can fake out the source. You can be a Russian operative uh, in a building in Moscow, uh, pretending to be a college kid in Cincinnati, and nobody really knows the difference. And uh, unless fake book somehow is able to distinguish that, we're, we're faked out by the source. Um, it's, it's really the same thing. And, and so you begin to get this really queasy feeling about where, where do I look? Where do I go? What is, what is the role of the press? It's changing. The press is changing. The role of the press is changing. I understand why those kids are signing up to take these courses. Mm -hmm. This is a very interesting subject and perhaps more interesting than it was 10, 20, 30 years ago because it's, it's, there's no constraint on it these days. <laughs> yeah. And, and no it has a big effect. Anymore. This goes to the second article. Why don't you talk about that? This is about registration forms to vote. Yeah, some uh, media sources, uh, including uh, the, the, the story focused on the Ithaca Times, which is a small weekly newspaper in New York, um, basically expanding its role um, to some degree of, of promoting democracy and journalism by instead of having a front page full of stories, their front page was a voter registration form. And you could simply fill it out right on the top of the newspaper, tear it out, mail it in, and you're registered to vote. And that's something that, um, you know, when you think about the money in politics, the money primary that decides our candidates, even if we get a Republican or a Democrat candidate, they've already been vetted by all the money people, so they're, they're you know, sort of of the same cloth anyway. Uh, you know, how do you take that back? And it's got to start with, you know, uh, putting into action your rights as a citizen. At the floor is voting, at the very bottom floor. Like, you can't go any lower than voting. You can do more, like you can run for office and you can, you know, raise, uh, you know, community organize and do lots more. But if you don't vote, you know, you're really uh, in the basement of our society yeah, in our terms society of being a citizen. Come apart soon yeah. enough if you don't. Yeah, vote. you're hiding in the basement. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so yeah. come out of the basement. It's... Even if you come out and you know you don't know all the candidates, fine. Don't vote for the people you don't know. But if you support somebody, vote for that person and get your voice in there. And the only, um, you know, you think I think a lot about how disenfranchised I feel and probably everybody feels when. When senators and, and the House of Representatives are making these decisions that don't reflect, you know, our personal values, anything like what can I do in Hawaii, in Hawaii especially since it's, um, you know, basically a one-party state and there's not a lot of, you know, uh, choice in, in terms of your candidates. Uh, what can you do? And if, you know, what you can do is start paying attention to local races. You can start voting on. You can start, um, you know, being engaged, going to meetings, uh, giving your voice to the to the environment and then seeing how that what, what happens. I don't know why, but I'm reminded of the caucus um, before the uh, last presidential election, the caucus here in Hawaii. Seventy percent of the people in the Democratic caucus were, were on Bernie's side, voted for Bernie in the mm. caucus. Mm. It's, not, it's not an official thing, it's just a party caucus. But then the delegation uh, went to the, um, you know, the convention, they all voted for Hillary Clinton even though 70% of the people wow, here, wow. 70, voted, voted for Bernie. That. So it just ignored it completely. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you could lose confidence in the system when you see that sort of thing happening. You, know? you definitely can. And then there's all this corruption within the political system here. Um, I read a story recently about how basically every politician in the state or almost every politician is ignoring the disclosure forms and the fines are so small that they just like, you know, take it out of their big uh, lumps of corporate money that they get and, and pay it off and they don't care. So, I mean, there's a lot of dysfunction and corruption that, um, you know, I think it, it, the, the change begins with the citizen who's, who kind of stands up and says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my part. And then if everybody does that, it actually will change. Well, I think the press is changing. The, with the Ithaca Times... Uh, reflects um, a possibility that any paper might consider, you know, taking, a, a taking an affirmative action, saying, here, you want to vote, this is what you do, it's right here, cut it out of our, our paper, or if it's a, 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 you know, a website, then print it off the website and si sign it and send it in. Mm -hmm. Or some of, some of the papers in that article, uh, we're just giving you a link. Mm -hmm. You just press the link and you mm -hmm. go in, although I like, I like the idea of having the whole form <laughs> visible, you know. On the front page. 
on the front page. Yeah, that's pretty exciting. It's really saying something. Yeah. So, it, you know, it, uh, there's a lot of Im implications here about the Ithaca Times. One of them is that, that that's, a, that's a proactive step. That's an affirmative action step. And it means that the role of the newspaper, at least in their view, is changing. Mm -hmm. Would you say that's uh, another sea change around the country? Mm -hmm. uh, if it isn't, should it be? And how do we achieve it? Well, it's part of the idea that newspapers and websites and magazines and you know television news and whatever, they're all in the same business, and that's to promote democracy. And if you're not doing that, you're not doing your job. If, if you think you're in the business to sell car ads, then you're in the wrong business. <laughs> and uh, people, people are fairly savvy. You know, the, the each generation that comes through UH, I see they're more and more media savvy, more and more media literate is what we call it. And they can see when it's a shill type situation, you know, when you're, you're cooking on the TV and you're using all the products that are advertising with you and it's just basically a, a long infomercial or, or, you know, you have your Coke can sitting in front of you when you're, when you're, when you're talking to somebody, uh, they see product placement and, and they pick that up now a lot uh, quicker than they used to. Yeah. So. Um, Good. Bench, basically, the the people who continue to try to trick folks, I think, will wither in importance. And I hope die. so. Yeah. Something you said really touched me, though. You said that um, it's their duty. They exist to promote democracy. Mm -hmm. The press exists to promote democracy. You know, and I've heard it said for many years, and I'm, I believe it's true, is that the, when the founders said, um, "We are separating church and state." Uh, and we are going to make, uh, you know, we go, we're going to give the, the churches a break. Um, you know, no, don't get taxed, right? Uh, they have all kinds of special privileges, but they, they have to stay out of government. Mm -hmm. That's the price they pay. We give them a license, but we, we put an obligation on them to stay out of government. Mm -hmm. That's why it says, the, you know, the government shall not, what, they shall not uh, create a church and there will be a separation of church and state. Okay, the same thing kind of comes out on the First Amendment provision about freedom of, freedom of the press. It says, we are giving you license. Here's a constitutional provision that says you are free, and you have a special blessing to go out and do it. And because of that, you have an obligation to protect this constitution. It's inherent in right. the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. you, you know, just as you said, Brett, you know, they, they, the press, has an obligation to protect democracy because they have this special license. It's inherent in the whole system. Yeah, <laughs> that's the deal. Yeah. We don't have uh, licenses and credentials. Like, you don't have to have official, take an official test like the bar to be a journalist. Your, uh, your license is the First Amendment. Yeah, and right. all of us can do it. Right, right. And that's what's so special about the United States. Anywhere else you go in the world, they're all envious of our freedoms here. Yeah. And if we don't protect that, it will go away. And it's start, it's you know starting to be chipped away for sure with, with uh, this this uh, attack on the media. Yeah, and I, lest we forget, uh, the um, Secretary of Homeland Security is keeping a list on journalists. <laughs> I don't know if we've talked about that. I don't think we've talked no. about that. Uh, she has 1,700, at last count, journalists in her special list. And her special list is a matrix which includes what you've said, what you've written, your propensities politically. That's mm. in the list, too. Mm. This reminds me of 1934, yeah. um, that she should keep a list. And she announced that. What, what chutzpah, what hubris to announce that she's keeping a list of you and your friends and your graduates and everybody in the press to find out what you've said. Because on Judgment Day, they may be knocking at your door, Brett. This is very scary. Um, well, I hope there's a list being kept of people like that, that uh, we, and they end up with their orange jumpsuits at the end when they're complicit right, on all this right. corruption and crime. So. We need to keep a list of the people keeping <laughs> not, the it's, list. Yeah, it's not, just the, it's not just the person at the top that is doing, doing this criminal behavior. It's, you know, all these... Uh, uh, toadies and cronies that are en enabling and being complicit and grifting and so um, she can keep whatever list she wants that's her right but then we can also keep our own list yes and we do and the mm -hmm. press does happy to see that 
and I, I really love it when the, when the New York Times comes out with all the lies. Mm -hmm. And more and more, I see that happening in the press, and I see it. I see a sea change. I see. You know, I see if you agree with me, a, a sea change where the press is sort of, you know, feeling that it's time to push back on some of this war on the press. It's time to take a stand, like publishing the voter registration form. There have been so many mm, attacks on voting in the past year and a half. It's incredible. Well, this is pushing back on it. But, but let me ask you, how far does that go? For example, um, uh, I don't like uh, the way a certain initiative is going in government. And the Ithaca Times could publish a letter with the salient public officials listed and their addresses and emails you publish that letter on the front page and all you have to do is cut it out, sign it, and send it in. Is that going too far? Uh, not legally, but I think there's an ethical issue with that. It, it's uh, in the realm of, you know, who is a public official that deserves, you know, public scrutiny. If you're sending it into their office and it's a pre-made form, they just toss them anyway. If you're sending it to their house and you got, you know, little voodoo dolls in the envelope and, <laughs> no. you know, things like that, then you, you, that's where it does go too far. And they have, you know, um, on the Internet that happens quite often where they publish people's addresses and phone numbers and people get harassed, including uh, the woman who is accusing uh, Brett Kavanaugh of, yeah. of uh, trying to rape her. That... A woman, you know, she has her story to tell, and before she even gets a chance to tell it, she's being, you know, attacked by trolls across the, the world, trying to shut her down and scare her. Yeah, indeed they do that, but I, but I have to say that they do that using the press. They use the press mm -hmm. to make it hot for her, to make it impossible for her to, to intimidate her from testifying. Um, and query, you know, where where does that fit in the in the new press that, that we see evolving. Is it, is, it, is it something where the press ought to reconsider um, making her a target, uh, reconsider uh, intimidating her, or allowing other people to intimidate her? Um, it's, it's, it has an effect for sure, and the effect is probably a bad effect. But where is the conscience of the press on that now, in this most difficult time for the press in the 21st century? Well, each um, organization or individual have to figure out their line. We have a, a, a code of ethics that we follow. You know, people that are, um, you know, ethical journalists, they, we've come together and we've created a code of ethics, so we, we follow that. But in, in these kinds of cases, I think it's maybe wiser for everybody to just start thinking of themselves as a public citizen. You know, you have your public face and your private face. and. When you're in the public sphere, even if you're a nobody from nowhere, uh, it, there's, there's a chance you get sucked into the vortex and have to um, be in this kind of stage. And you just have to be prepared for it. And you have to you know, shield yourself however you want. But um, otherwise, we all sit in our house with our shutters drawn and uh, cower under the blankets. I mean, there's and just watch not, the democracy deteriorate. And you just do watch fascism take over. So th there's not really a lot of in-between on that. It's just the way the technology works and communication travels and the ability, the decentralized control systems. Um, you know, there's always that fear. I mean, I've been uh, uh, attacked by troll armies uh, for columns I've written, and you just have to kind of develop a, a thick skin about it uh, to some degree. I'm not excusing it. I'm just saying it's the reality. And, and if you, you have the choice of either I guess, not facing up or not coming to the... Um, uh, the place where you can talk about what you want, or um, you know, taking taking on this kind of wave that could come at you. And a lot, and a lot of people actually live in this unreasonable fear that that's going to happen, and it really doesn't happen. So they, um, it, it has a magnifying effect on silencing people, where they think, oh, if I say anything to anybody, I'm going to have this troll army attack me. I'm going to have people like you know, pipe bombing my mailbox or whatever. And those things do happen. I'm not uh, saying they don't, but they don't happen as often as, mm -hmm. as you might imagine. And, and people definitely uh, living in fear say less uh, w without you know, cause. You're calling for courage. Courage. 
But you're calling for courage. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. You're calling for courage not only with the classical, conventional members of the press, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the conventional, mm, you know, organizations of the press, but you're calling for courage from everyone who makes a public statement. Because the, the notion of making a public statement has expanded with the technology to everyone. I mean, there's so many, you can be a citizen journalist and you're still a, a journalist, aren't you? Yeah. Um, so courage, am I right? In your view, courage applies to everyone who speaks or can speak publicly. We're all international publishers with social media. And in that role, we have to be able to stand behind what we say. And yeah, I think courage is a good word for it. We have to figure out what we stand for, what we want to say about that, and then do it. Conscience and courage. Conscience and courage. Thanks like for it. coming down, Brett. Always wonderful. To talk to you. <laughs> All right, you too. You too. See you next time soon. Okay, thank you. <laughs>